Yes, get guess who got brands talking. Brandlive.co.za You're listening to Inside Outer. Welcome to uh, Inside Outer. This is our weekly podcast, which gives you an insight into how we work at Outer and how we promote civil activism. Uh, I'm your host, Wayne Duvenage. I'm the CEO of uh, Outer. And today my guest is Business Leadership SA CEO, Bonang Mukhali. Bonang, nice to have you with us today. Thanks for your time. Wayne, thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure, man. Uh, look, Banang uh, to most doesn't need much introduction. He's, the, as I said, the chief executive of Business Leadership South Africa, which is uh, it's a growing organization in that its stature and its um, impact on society has certainly taken a, a whole new leap. Um, you come from a background of business. You've been uh, with Shell, the vice president of Shell South Africa. You were a pharmacist. You've trained, uh, and and you've come an extremely long way, Benang. But you are very visible today in the space of uh, making sure that business now elevates its vocality and its presence uh, in in society. Because I think that is one thing that has been missing. Uh, largely uh, in, in the past. So thanks again for your time. Um, tell us a little bit about the role of business leadership and, and how specifically uh, does it work uh, as it conducts itself in circumventing corruption in, in South Africa? So first of all, this is the only organization of CEOs. We represent 86 CEOs of large companies, right. most of them listed on the JSE, a number of them with dual listings. This organization was founded in 1960 mm. with a dual purpose of defending apartheid mm -hmm. and sanction busting. Yeah. It was called the South African Foundation. Okay. They used to give it a sexy name at that time uh, called import substitution. Okay. So one of the reasons why we fought and why people died and made supreme sacrifices mm. is so that there are no go areas. Yeah. So our mission is to go into the belly of business leadership South Africa, right. help it to transform so that it can really make itself relevant mm -hmm. into the new South Africa because it has an inordinate role to play. Yeah. Only 53 of our 86 members are responsible for more than half of the GDP of this country. Mm -hmm. So if business can successfully transform, can you imagine? South Africa will transform, especially in the wake of what we are facing this, these days. Yeah. 24 years into democracy, I think we, we still have huge challenges. But the last 10 years, we have definitely been taken back 20 years uh, yeah. by state capture. Yeah. So at a high level, I think what we still need to face and to fix is to root out and defeat state capture. Number two, we still need to reduce the debt of this government. It's too mm -hmm. high. Number three, we still need to reduce a bloated civil service, but so should we reduce uh, the student enterprises and state-owned companies. Yeah. Because in the last nine years, they were just filled up uh, mm. and bloated. And as a result, today we are indeed in the uh, spot of bother. The last two, we need to abandon uh, glamorous infrastructure projects yeah. like uh, the nuclear deal, yeah. which by the testimony uh, of the Minister of Finance mm. uh, last week would have cost this country 1.5 trillion South African rents, thereby like indebting yeah. Yeah. our great-grandchildren. And then lastly, I think we need to continue to increase parliamentary oversight mm -hmm. because we have learned that when we join hands with the rest of civil society, yeah. we need to ensure that not only do you hold these public servants finally accountable, but insist in policy making as well. Yeah, no, great stuff. Um, Bonang, uh, a couple of things that come out of that uh, introduction. The first one is um, on state owned entities. It's, it, it, it is amazing how government gets into the business of business. And, and for instance, we're bailing out an organization like SAA, uh, being one, and, and I know there are others. And yet this is a competitive industry. Governments are not really in the competitive space of business. Uh, so is it your view then, from a business point of view, that we should be asking government to look very carefully at what it invests its time and, and, and the state's money in? Because services like that really shouldn't be supplied by a, a government institution. You see, as South Africans, we confuse the benefits of a state ailer mm -hmm. with ownership. Yeah. To get all the benefits 
of tourism, of connecting cities, of uh, stimulating economic activity. You don't have to own an airline, especially if you are doing a bad job of it. Yeah. You know, in 2007, on the way to uh, Pulukwane, yeah. SAA domestically had a 35% market share. Yeah. Today, domestically, it has a 15% market share. Nice, yeah. Uh, the other airlines have stolen its lunch yeah. because we just mismanaged it. Uh, it was the crucible of corruption and state capture. Yeah. All state-owned enterprises. Yeah. Today, most of them trade recklessly. Yeah. Uh, there's only one or two uh, that are financially viable. Mm -hmm. All of them um, have probably three challenges. One, they need to be adequately capitalized. Yeah. Number two, governance needs to be absolutely paramount. And then lastly, they need to do what is it that they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So in the case of ESCOM, their job is to keep the lights on and to perform planned and preventative maintenance. Imagine if you had a car, you ran it hard 24-7 mm. without taking it for its scheduled maintenance, whether this is every 10,000 kilometers or 15,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you have the life cycle of that car. That's exactly what we've been doing. Yeah. Uh, we have probably the fourth largest utility in the world. Um, the one that has the biggest build program yeah. in terms of generation in the world. Yeah. Uh, the only one in the world that still does a generation distribution and transmission Amazing. in one entity when most of these, everywhere else in the world, Should are three separate yeah. entities and listed uh, in three separate ways. At the very least, we need to be at least breaking it up into two. We now have 48,000 people at ESCOM, 15,000 too much. Yeah. The executives were only 20. Now there's 80 of them. Here's a company that is borrowed to the hilt. Yeah. It's dead. It's approaching 500 billion. Uh, 350 billion of that is government guarantees. They've already accessed uh, 285. But when you look at their balance sheet mm. from these build programs, uh, Midu, Bikusile, and Ingula, I think the debt per annum is probably 47 billion. When you look at what it requires just to service the interest on the debt, that's probably another 30. Yeah. You add the two, it's 90 yeah. billion. But the cash generated from operations is no more than 43 billion. Therefore, you have to go and borrow yeah. to service just the interest. Imagine if you had a house and you can't afford <laughs> not just the mortgage, but yeah. just to service interest. So you can see that in the useful life of ESCO, it will never be able yeah. to repay this debt unless it is fundamentally yeah. Restructured. So, so Bonang, um, absolutely very clear. State and institutions um, have become in disarray, certainly over the last year. Um, business, do you believe that, that uh, you know, the Edelman Trust Barometer indicated recently that the, um, that, that the business needs to play a bigger role, you know, certainly in influencing government policy. Uh, and, and yet we believe and can see that up until recently, um, business has been pretty much missing in action. I know that you've come to the stage, you've high highlighted that and, and heightened uh, business's presence. But what more should business be doing? You know, we've got NEDLAC, but NEDLAC we've had for so long and we're still in the mess that we're in. What do you have to do as business leadership? As you say, you control a lot of the, of the, in, in, uh, the, the, the uh, generating of the economy in South Africa. But there's a lot more that has to be done. Much, surely. much more, especially when you consider that Business was instrumental in propping up the National Party government. Yeah. Not for 48 years, mm. for 350 yeah, years. For a long time. Because a colonialism Our whole history, started yeah. in 1652. Yeah. The 1913 Land Act was the 10th land expropriation without compensation against mm -hmm. African people. Yeah. So there have been probably 15 land expropriation without compensation done lawfully yeah. against African people. Yeah. So now, in the new South Africa, 24 years into democracy, not only should business play a significant role, it must play a leadership role, yeah. especially in six areas. Yeah. Number one, on land, business must be explicit as to why it supports land expropriation without compensation. Right not only because land is central mm -hmm. to the struggle of African people, yeah. but because the agenda is land reform. And there are three components to that. Mm -hmm. One is land restitution, yeah. 
The second is land redistribution. The last piece is about land development. Yes. That's where you find um, uh, property rights. Yeah. That's where you find Section 25, Article 3A, that talks about security of tenure. That's where you find a wonderful clause that says, when conditions of fair and equitable have been fulfilled, compensation can be down to zero. Yeah. Therefore, you don't need to amend the constitution because no country should think of amending a constitution lightly yeah. because that's the thin end of the wedge. You want yeah. to provide uh, regulatory certainty and policy stability, especially if you are an African country because you start from a position of disbelief and distrust yeah. by most developed countries. Secondly, we need to be clear about transformation because this economy must be broadly reflective yeah. of the demographics. And it's so black right. people right. are 90% of the population. Yeah. And yet white males own 70% yeah. uh, of the wealth of this country, but also 70% of positions of leadership. Yeah. And often with, we inappropriately uh, and erroneously talk about the Gini coefficient yeah. of 0.69, yeah. but that refers only to income inequality. Yeah. When you look at asset uh, inequality, it's 0.95. Oh, yes, yeah. uh, and you can see that it's not sustainable. Thirdly, I think all of us need to wake up and accept and internalize that we are in a fiscal crisis. Yeah. We are in a mess uh, and we need to do extraordinary things. That is why the president launched uh, the, the economic stimulus. Yeah. The fourth <clears throat> is how do we ensure that this economy grows? Because until and unless we can talk about economic growth, very soon we'll be talking about the redistribution of poverty, yeah. not the redistribution <clears throat> of wealth. Yeah. It's only when the economy grows. And that, inclusively. Yeah. Yes, that productivity goes up. Yeah. And that, you're absolutely correct. It has to be an inclusive yeah. socio-economic growth. That's right. And then the penultimate two is a piece around jobs. Yeah. 27.2% unemployment. Mm. It's a disaster. Continue. Youth unemployment, 56%. <clears throat> Today, there's 6.2 million young people, a majority of them graduates, that want to work, yeah. but cannot find work. 10 million of 35 years and younger that are not in education, employment, or training. 17 million on social security and only 15 million are gainfully employed. You can see that mm. it's not sustainable. Yeah. And then lastly, I think we need to be very uh, mindful of education because education is the only thing um, that can make sure that you get born in informal settlements of Alexander. Yeah. Yeah. But within 20 to 24 years, you can afford a house in the leafy suburbs of Bryanston. Not because you got a tender, but because you have earned it, you deserve it, and you have worked hard. Yeah. No, look, Benang, there's no doubt about it. It's shocking. We should not be in this situation. Um, and, and, and here we are having to grapple with this, and there's a lot of work to do. We've got to get ourselves out of this whole business is, is a big component and player in this space. Um, what is it that business, uh, you know, we had the job summit, but uh, there's a, there was a lot of criticism around it. We, uh, for one, were critics around the fact that jobs don't fall out of the sky. We've got to generate economic growth. We've got to stimulate entrepreneurship. We've got to stimulate investment. And that brings the jobs, not just having a job summit. Where are we going to, how are we going to do this? Uh, what is business's role in driving this? So the job summit Thursday and Friday was mm. embarrassingly successful, profoundly mm. practical in the commitments that we made. So the work you do before the summit, because mm. in the summit you allow the president to make announcements mm -hmm. on what has already been agreed. Mm -hmm. So the four social partners mm -hmm. were magnanimous yeah. in coming up with five commitments around growing this economy, around investing in small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, we're very clear about we need to keep the current jobs that we have mm -hmm. before we even think about creating new ones. Yeah. So we spoke about how we are going to have a layoff uh, fund resuscitated because it's sitting there, yeah. but companies, the first thing that they think of is layoffs, retrenchments, etc. We spoke about a high-level 
a task team, response team mm -hmm. of experienced business people that mm -hmm. when your private business is in trouble, yeah. that you can have at least 10 of these people that help you think through strategically about how you can save mm -hmm. these jobs probably for the next uh, two or three years. And yeah. uh, we made commitments around procurement. Isn't it amazing that 24 years into de democracy, we still need to talk about being yeah. proudly South African yeah. and procuring locally. And here, the biggest culprit is government. Yeah. They have a contract, the biggest contract in the world to buy locomotives, yeah. 1064 of them. From Just Transnet. Yeah. I'm excluding Brasas locomotives. Mm. Yes. And none of those are American. bought from two companies that have made all the trains in this country uh, since uh, we... Shocking. Sad. In living memory. Yeah, and yeah. one of them is called Union Courage yeah. in Bradburn. Yeah. And we decided to give them to China uh, South Rail. Um, at the time that the policy of this country is about uh, re-industrialization, mm -hmm. beneficiation, localization, and creating black industrialists. None of those went to BE companies. And that's a classic example of Absolutely. state capture. But, but also what shocks me is that uh, even after we have established the Zondo Commission, yeah. the new Gent Commission on SARS, yeah. this government, last week Sunday, says they are going to uh, renovate 29 flats yeah. at a cost, renovate, not build, yeah, yeah. at a cost 3 .6 of 3.6 million each. each yeah. But even the paint is imported. Even the wood for the decking is imported. Oh, the only reason why they could import that is so that uh, they ensure that they can eat because if they gave it to a black industrialist, mm -hmm. maybe they will not eat. Even the last regime, they would have the face of ANC t-shirts printed. Mm -hmm. uh, six million of them made from China. So I think the president was clear to say, we must be proudly South African. Yeah. We must procure locally. We need to put systems and processes to make sure that is done. Wayne, in conclusion, I think really two things. One, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that is facing boards in terms of governance and oversight mm -hmm. is to ensure that corporate decision making yeah. is not only consistent with the whims of the shareholders, yeah. but is consistent with the will of the greater uh, stakeholder community, yeah. including the commitments that have been made by the executives. Lastly, education matters. Mm. We are the only country in Africa since uh, Ghana's 1957 of Kwame Nkrum. Every single solitary one of them, when they got free from colonialism, they improved education. Yeah. Ghana, 10 years into democracy, 80% uh, literacy rate. Zimbabwe today, mm. Gabriel Robert Mugabe, 94% mm. literacy rate. Yeah. South Africa is the We're only struggling. one that we took uh, apartheid education mm. and we ran it to the ground with 30 percent it's not now acceptable pass why education because education mat matters mm. you know when one steadily bends the midnight oil one gets access to the domain of knowledge and wisdom yeah. the world of meaning the world that cannot be conquered without a persistent crusade thank you sir well thank you very much Benang. it's been nice chatting with you we've got a lot of work to do business leadership we're going to be looking to you a, a, a lot uh, as you mentioned in education, we've got a big project uh, that is going on the CETAs. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that's going wrong there. So we look forward to working with you. Uh, thanks for taking time. And uh, to our listeners, if you want to listen to this interview, please go to our website at arta.co.za. Thanks again, Bonang. All the it's, best. It's been an absolute privilege, sir. And thank you for having me. Lovely. Thanks, Wayne. Live from 27 boxes in the heart of Melville, this is brandlive.co.za. <laughs> Demand good governance. Join us weekly on Inside Outer. Thanks for listening to Inside Outer. Tune in next week when we delve deeper into undoing tax abuse. Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za